So welcome, uh, Susanna Lindbergh. I believe this is recording. Yes, it is. And uh, we're here to talk about a, um, a topic that is very timely, contemporary. It's the, uh, the stuff of who we are. I could say it's the tapestry of our lives, but if I use the word tapestry, it sounds a little bit like AI. I don't know if you noticed, but most AI models are fanatics of the metaphor of tapestry, which is a very old metaphor. But if you ask ChatGPT or, or Claude or Gemini, they will very often use uh, the metaphor of tapestry. Uh, we might come back to this uh, mysterious um, mechanical uh, unconscious. Your book is called um, From Technological Humanity to Biotechnical Existence. And uh, it was published by Sony Press. And this is quite convenient because we are, uh, as, a, as a group with other researchers, starting a platform that we call Enriched Reality. And enriched realities questions our relationship with uh, with uh, digital environments that are now ubiquitous, right? And that are sometimes called, in the case of VR or uh, extended reality, they're called enriched reality. So uh, as if we uh, lived uh, before the digital in the reality that was poor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you do write that and you do recognize in your book that digital technologies have a strong existential impact i'm quoting you because they contribute to what is called thinking so this is actually not necessarily uh, a sentence that one would have expected right because uh, we're more used to hear that it contributes to unthinking or what is or or perhaps stupidity so mm -hmm. can can you tell me more about this sentence well uh of course if we stop thinking by ourselves and delegate our thinking to a machine that is a uh, uh, stupidifying it makes us more stupid that's uh, something that bernard stiegler in particular has spoken about but i don't think most of us use uh, digital technologies that way. I think we really cooperate with them. Uh, we delegate something of our thinking to computers, uh, but that is supposed to enhance our ordinary uh, reality. So for instance, if we use uh, digital tools in order to remember better, uh, well, they really make us remember better. We can find things, we can contact people more easily. Um, thanks to these uh, technologies. So uh, so starting from the moment when we have these kind of tools at our disposal, uh, of course, uh, well, for instance, when it comes to remembering, we, uh, we accept to remember a bit less because we know how to find, uh, find things that we have just put in memory somewhere, but this should uh, enable other, other kinds of thinking. And this is what we do all the time. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that we, uh, uh, our, thinking is exactly impoverished, but I think it's reconfigured somewhere. And mm. that we have to learn to think with this new kind of, uh, yeah, augmented po form of thinking, perhaps. Right. And you, you... Simplification too, of course. So I don't deny that. Mm. Yeah, you speak of uh, memory, for example, and thinking. So you're a professor of continental philosophy uh, at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. And thinking for a continental philosopher doesn't mean the same thing than thinking in other contexts, right? Uh, whether it's analytic philosophy, but even psychology, where there's a lot of discourse today about overthinking, right? There's a sort of a, anti, uh, intele a rampant anti-intellectualism. What, what do we mean by thinking? Oh la la, that's what takes us to the very big questions of philosophy. So, uh, well, if we say continental philosophy, so thinking has something to do with an experience, I think, always. Mm. So you are exposed to something that calls to be thought, that needs to be thought. This something 
that is out there to be thought normally um, destabilizes something in your previous manners of thinking, for thinking to be important, for thinking to be creative, and then you try to uh, come to terms with this thing. So thinking in the sense uh, that this is an experience, of course, you cannot simply delegate this part to a machine. You, that's something that human beings do. We think when we try to figure out stuff. But I would say that today, one of the things that we think about and one of the things that make us think is also this digital reality. So uh, in some sense, it brings us new things, uh, let's say a, a much bigger memory than we ever had. So we have to think about that, but also much more importantly, uh, it shows another mode of thinking or uh, of computing or, or of dealing with information. And then we are called upon uh, by that. So we should think about uh, our digital devil and ask ourselves, how do we think with that? What, what do we get out of this? What do we do with that? And how do we cooperate with that? So this kind of, uh, uh, I think there is this uh, division of jobs in a sense. So we think uh, that is still something that human beings do when you say thinking in this big and philosophical and continental philosophy uh, kind of uh, sense. But then there are intellectual operations uh, everywhere in the world and especially in digital realities. So I'm thinking, relates to these intellectual operations and tries to yeah uh, have an experience of them and uh, an answer to them somehow maybe this is uh, right. this is part of the answer mm -hmm. yes and here we, we're starting to unfold things slowly but uh, we understand we sort of posit that thinking needs to be embodied because it's an experience uh correct me if i'm if i'm wrong or un unless you think that we can have a disembodied uh, experience. Yeah, I think this uh, term of uh, embodiedness is a little bit difficult. I don't use it myself that often because somehow as soon as you say embodied, you remember the philosophical mind-body distinction somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I'm not convinced by this distinction at all. I think we overcame it in, with the invention of phenomenology in a sense, mm -hmm. at least at the latest with, uh, uh, with Merleau-Ponty. So uh, yeah, it is embodied in the sense that it takes place somewhere to someone. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I'm not sure if this somewhere and someone needs to have this kind of a body, which is made mm -hmm. of and blood and uh, bones and that kind of things. Okay. All but, right. So I say that's human being because, because I don't know anybody else, anything else than humans mm -hmm. who are thinking in that way, or perhaps some animals, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, Right. But I don't know if, if it's the body that thinks. Mm. Right. You do mention at the end of the book, uh, when you will come back to that, but when you speak of biotechnics, mm -hmm. that um, there are two components, sensing and sense making. Mm -hmm. What you're saying now is, so this could be constitutive of thinking, but this sensing and sense making does not necessitate a necessarily a, a flesh and blood em embodiment yes you are right and i'm going to say something that uh to which i don't believe actually because i think in reality between us uh we need flesh and blood i believe in the in the human body or living bodies i think that is a, still a the the place in which experience takes place but i'm just somehow suspicious of the word uh, body because of this form, because of this idea of organization that comes with the term. And this is why I prefer speaking about life or living processes, living matter. Mm -hmm. So I'm not so sure where its limits are. It might be unlimited sometimes or with changing limits. Uh, the term body is complicated for me. The term life is less complicated okay. because this is what we are, I think. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, and and you do mention in in the first part of the book that um, forms of life are are plural, and uh, and of course your book is part of the general um, say the stream of thought that tries to develop a non 
anthropocentric uh, worldview. Am I correct, or would you say it differently? Um, I guess I should admit that. <laughs> I think so. Uh, it is a book on what the human being has become. Uh, that's for sure. And I, I think that in many ways, human being has become much less certain of what human means. We have become plural, we have become fleshly or living, that kind of things. We are less distinguished from animal beings or technical beings than we used to be. But still, I think we cannot completely get rid of this term. I think the term is somehow, yeah, it's a paleonym, for instance. Mm. But, so we still instinctively think in terms of it, and we have to keep it mm. some. Mm. Instinctively course, or, cultural, or culturally? Sorry? There, is, it, is it an instinct? Is our anthropocentrism, anthropocentrism an instinct, or is it just simply um, a cultural privilege that we maintain? Mm. I think it's a political reality. Right. So so we, we have a reality which is constructed by humans for humans in terms of humans, and this is creating enormous impact on everything else on the planet as well. Mm. So to that extent, uh, it's unavoidable to take human beings in account. So politically, it's a fact. And therefore, also sociologically, scientifically, it's a fact that there are human beings and we have to take them very seriously if we want to understand what happens in this uh, in this world. Mm -hmm. uh, but somehow, what we are to ourselves has changed. And how we understand ourselves, there is something, uh, right. it's not so clear that we are human, so simply human beings. Perhaps mm -hmm. we don't correspond internally to our political role anymore. Mm -hmm. Perhaps something like right. that. Yeah, and you, you do define, I mean, you you, you do define the, the human by its plasticity, its capacity for inventivity and change. So you're, you're on the side of... Uh, the, the tradition of philosophical anthropology, but also uh, most of French philosophy in the 20th century is fascinated by our creative um, capacities. Mm -hmm. So we're not talking about a defined and fixed human nature here. Mm -hmm. However, I think this, this point is important when you mentioned we need to take uh, humans uh, seriously it's important because today we know that uh, for example in europe um ai policies are and this is written in in the now uh, law they they are required to be human centric and i find this extremely uh, problematic because you know human centric for me, it's a synonym of anthropocentric. So it's sort of we are we are not learning from 200 years of being human centric and the uh, the um, destabilization of of the uh, earthly balance that it, this might have caused. So you speak about life before. So if we say, for example, that AI should be life centric which is not in the text of law of the European policy, would would it change something compared to, to human-centric? Or do you think it's it's a good thing to have human-centric AI by, uh, by law? That's a hugely interesting question. So there's very many aspects to that. I think one aspect is the most... Uh, traditional one in a sense what does it mean to be human centric so in the yeah enlightenment tradition uh, of your on which european legislation is based i suppose uh, of course human can mean uh, in a very restrictive manner we who are like this so white european middle class and blah 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 and then it's of course very critical but then you can also look uh, look at the what human being is in a, in a post kantian tradition. So it is a capacity of freedom, of free thinking, self-critique, and all of that. And if you continue this line 
of definition of what human is, then you come to this very plastic, very mobile, very uh, unfixed form of humanity that uh, that the French tradition is speaking about. And then I think, yeah, I have nothing against because uh, because I think this is what we are. I haven't come to anything better. So this is one side. This is the more, more conservative side of the answer. So perhaps it is good to... Uh, to take human centric, uh, accept some human centrism, if it means quite simply, uh, keep open the human capacity of freedom and thinking and mm -hmm. self protection and self critique and blah, blah, blah. And uh, and consider that all technological inventions have to set, uh, keep that possibility open. So this is one side. Mm -hmm. But then it's much more interesting what you just said about life centric. Uh, uh, digital technologies mm. that is something because in that case you would extend the, the same idea that technology has to serve something but not only to us humans who have done well the anthropocene uh, but to uh, to life much more uh, generally mm. uh, you would say technology has to say, serve a livable life for all life livable mm. world or life so that would of course be tremendously interesting mm. we are very far from there politically i think it will be a wonderful yeah. idea so indeed and and we're going to enter into the core of your book which is the um the understanding of what technology and technique really is but on on uh, on this topic i think there's a third way in which human centric is understood today which is, I think, very anti-intellectualist, very emotional. It has to do with basically uh, the um, the universalization of the medical discourse. Is basically uh, we need to save, we need to preserve and save as many human lives as possible. And and I think there is. Um, the integration of diversity, because at least in 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 the text, right? Because no one is uh, full enough to say, "Oh, this is to preserve the European uh, white male," which, by the way, doesn't uh, exist uh, a bit so much uh, anywhere. But uh, I think there is this idea that uh, we need to preserve human lives um, at all cost. And if we are life centric, well, it, there might be an equation, a compossibility to to speak in Lebanese terms, a uh, a configuration of the world in which actually we shouldn't save as many human lives as possible for Gaia to uh, be um, continuing its and naturing uh, healthy effect. So. I, I do not, um, I think it's, a, of course, it's problematic here, right? Because we do not have a a great understanding of, of balance, actually. We do, we do speak a lot of balance today, of ecology, ecosystem, environment. But if you interrogate the specialists, no one really can say what's the optimal balance in an ecosystem, right? Because then you, you if you if you want to answer that question, you enter in problems like, okay, so how many mosquitoes do we need in this area? Uh, how many uh, how many uh, of such and such uh, plant, such and such tree? And in the background of that, there is the big uh, taboo that no one would say, how many humans, right? Um, so this is a, a complex question. You might want to comment on that before we go into the the, uh, the sense, the understanding of the term uh, technique. And perhaps defining technique as you do will help us um, answer this, um, the, uh, the potential uh, menace for humans of being uh, life-centric, right? So... Technology for you and and for I mean it, a tradition that comes all the way from from Heidegger and and perhaps before uh, with Aristotle we'll we'll talk about that and Plato, but so it's not about uh, 
machines that are it's not the opposite of life right so you do note that in fact uh life is inherently technical what mm. does that mean yeah well that's a uh maybe it means that life inherently uh is inventive uh, on the one hand it can become something else than what it is and it reaches towards something and at some point of this process of inventing uh it becomes technical uh on the other hand uh, also life um is technical because it relates to something that it is not itself so this way of relating to something that it is not itself uh, very soon becomes a technique of using the world. So it's a question of using the world, not simply knowing the world or not simply consuming it, but using it and mostly in a creative manner. So uh, this, is a, right. this is an idea that also, uh, in a sense, uh, reflects a philosophy of German Romanticism. That mm -hmm. might be the invisible background idea that I had somewhere in my mind all the time. Somebody like Schelling would say, the core of life is a Kunst. It is an art. It's, an, it's a technique. It's a skill of living. It's a capacity of living. So this is what perhaps what I mean. Right. Right. It's, it sounds a little bit also like uh, what Latour called um, composition. Is it basically the creative advance of life is making configurations and yeah. this making of configurations is uh the uh the real foundational meaning of of technique which also resonates with what uh Deleuze and Gattari called machines right they saw machines everywhere and I think that's what also what they meant um by this agencing of of different uh, forms of life that use as you say each other uh, and you you do have a, a long uh, part on on the idea of use uh, that Agamben uh, mm. takes um, I think from Foucault perhaps or or Heidegger uh, but so okay so in in that sense it's interesting because now if we have this definition of technique which i think needs basically um also to presupposes a view of of life as as creative right it's very process philosophy would you agree i mean that's just a label right uh and and then what happens of ai then today there's this discourse about oh is ai really creative or not, right? And then there's the technical, I mean, here I should say the standard technical description where basically it's a remix theory uh, in the sense that we some people would say it's not really creative because it's just remixing mm -hmm. data in different ways, right? And, and other people say, well, that's creative because that's creation. Creation is just remixing. But um, I think in the tradition of process philosophy creation is more than remixing and i think mm -hmm. french philosophers they they are very attentive to to what some uh, but you but you would call it event or or uh, or uh, some people would call it uh, singularity which is by the way not the usual singularity that mm -hmm. um we talk about today but so there is uh, some at some point a an exception and that um i think interrogates the sense that we have that uh which, which is very scientific that things are just basically uh re-agencing in in different ways that evolution is just sort of a, this huge jigsaw puzzle materialistic uh in which sometimes some effects of um, feeling like a subject might emerge, but those are more or less um, an illusion for uh, for uh, for science or or for for certain 
views of consciousness. So coming back to this idea of technique, if if this is part of life, if life is constantly creating configurations and compositions that are that are the there's a continuum between this and what we call today machine, technical machines in the common sense. It isn't there, and uh, that's why I mentioned evolution there, isn't there therefore the emergence of a new species happening with AI and, and very soon robotics? Because I think in one year or two, we'll have the same, um, you know, hysteria uh, around the robots that are going to to mm. appear. So is is this a new? If we apply, one could say that if you apply your greed, it's actually a new species emerging. And basically, we could say, okay, no big deal, new species. Uh, they will probably eradicate us, but that's <laughs> how, that's how life goes. Yeah. So so there's many many uh, things in this um, question as well. So maybe one uh, one historical point first so so when i say that the techniques is a continuation of love uh, of 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 life or part of life in a sense so i don't think uh, think about a simple kind of emergence so that is to say that life gets more combinatory uh, becomes more complicated and so uh, a technical thing is somehow just the result of evolution of life itself not exactly in that sense. I think more about Aristotle, who says that, well, what is techniques? It is something, it continues uh, life, and it does something that life cannot do on its own. So they are in. A, there is a gap between the technical and the living always. And this gap is very interesting, because it's a gap over which... Uh, one needs the other. One is unthinkable without the other. You can't think about a techniques without a life that has created it. But also you cannot think about a life uh, which would be sufficient alone. So it's so somehow growing to become something else than it is. it was in the beginning. So there is a gap between techniques and life and still a connection. And, I, and then this is the Aristotelian background somewhere far behind us. And then we, if we take the same uh, way of thinking to our world and think about, let's say, artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is a kind of intelligence that we have uh, uh, constructed. We as a species, not me, absolutely not. Uh, so, so we have been able to construct something like uh, another form of uh, uh, intelligence, perhaps, which we do not have. We do not have that kind of intelligence ourselves. It's our fantasy in a sense. It doesn't forget, for instance. It's super rapid, super quick. It can calculate one million things at a at an instant and it never fails, that kind of thing. So it has features that we don't have. We have been able to construct something that we are not. It is a continuation of, uh, of our physics in a techniques, which is something else. And which, which at the same time wouldn't exist without us. So it is another thing. It's not just um, evolution bringing, combining parts of us into some uh, some 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 kind of an other uh, evolutionary step that comes after us. But it's a genuine invention. We invented it. We made something different than us, uh, which was unpredictable which was surprising and which surprises us as well. Something like that. I would say that there is a, uh, there is space for an, an invention, which is more than simply combining stuff mm -hmm. and bringing it together and uh, making an assemblage of, uh, of available elements. There is real invention in the process of inventing artificial intelligence. So whether that is another species or not, I don't know. You can, you can of course, analyze it in those terms and ask who is it, what it is, what does it want? Or then you can also see it all only as a simple tool for something else. I don't know uh, whether you can really decide in advance whether that's another species or not. Uh, you have to decide what you do with the notion of species in each case, where, where you need it to, what you do with it, something like that. 
And now I got lost. I don't know if I answered to your question. Uh, but of course, I mean, this is a conversation. So all questions echo each other. And we have time to to come back to things that have been said. Um, one point, I I would disagree with the fact that AI never fails. I think it fails a lot, right? But I, maybe we were talking about different uh, things here. Um, we, we know that uh, using conversational AI, for example, there's a lot of information that is yeah, sure. tabulated. Um, and some people would say, well, that and that's what is interesting in in the sense that we've been talking about process philosophy for process philosophers it's very important to say that creation is not a human feature it is a cosmic feature uh, it creates so uh in that sense if we apply it to what we said about ai uh it's not so much that we humans invented it is that we did something and this the human agency plus the cosmic agency uh the nature cre creating uh resulted in uh the ai that today we actually most um uh technicians of ai do not understand right the 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 uh creative part of the AI is a black box uh, that, and, and it's interesting that this is now today well known. It's part of popular culture, this black box thing. A few years ago, I was uh, working with computer scientists around 2018, 19, uh, where AI was becoming a really um, uh, if effective and and it was surprising for me that yes, for this computer science, they did not really understand how mm -mm. how it works. So uh, I think we need to be. I think there is a difference here, because we do not control what we create. Right? If I build a, a domino, something very simple, I can say, okay, I co I control this invention. Uh, I can understand it. But in this case, it is already something, and I think this this is where your concept of um, biotechnics uh, is with the knife and is is interesting because it is a combination of our agency and 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 another agency that is uh, beyond our control, uh, mm -hmm. whether you call it life or or. Um, or the creative real, et cetera. So coming back to what you call biotechnics and the gap that you were talking about. So you 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 manifest the gap by putting an iPhone in between bio and technical, right? Or techniques. And you do say, well, we cannot reduce the two to the same ontology, right? And, and that's what I I'm quoting you until now, but maybe you have your your views have changed. So, on the one hand, one could say, is this the is this a form of Cartesian dualism? But you've said that you are you were not a dualist in the beginning, or you are suggested that. But it sounds a little bit like uh, it. It could be a dualism, or at least if I reformulate the question differently, what is the agency that is filling the gap? Is it human agency? Is it another agency? I, I'm curious if 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 technique helps life doing what it cannot do, then it's not life helping itself. It's it's another entity, it sounds. Mm. So um, many, many things at the same time. So I start a little bit backwards in your question, because I know that you think about uh, uh, creation in a very general manner. So uh, as a cosmical force, in a mm -hmm. sense, it's not just a human capacity, but it's right. everything. 
And I can, I can uh, very much agree with that in a sense, but I, I like thinking about the whole reality as uh, as being a huge creative process in the sense of not being a mechanistic, uh, deterministic, simple process, process. So whatever mechanisms are behind, the result is surprising. Like in this example of the AI, which uh, you might construct in a mechanistic manner, but then something comes uh, out of it which is not mechanistic, which is a black box. Mm. So, so there I agree with you very much. So it's a, at least it's a very agreeable way of thinking into reality. I, I, I'm fond of that. Mm. Uh, then, uh, then what's the place of the human being in this story? So maybe we have to go back to this idea of what is thinking and saying that, well, it is, uh, it is where uh, experience is happening. Maybe, maybe not all creation is... Uh, um uh, is thinking it just it creates like in Deleuze and Guattari it machines well why not it creates you can say it that that way it produces something um but then sometimes for some creatures uh let's call them humans but I'm sure some others could have the same experience they think about their thinking they experience their experience. And then this re uh, self-reflective uh, fold, in a sense, well, that becomes the place in which thinking happens, something like that. And that's, uh, for the time being, I would say that this is what we can do, we humans, we know how to do that. Well, it happens to us. We don't actually very consciously choose to think. It just happens to us. Uh, I don't think uh, artificial intelligences do that yet, even though they might be self-reflective and even though they might uh, learn from their own experience. And I think there still is this kind of a right. distinction between our way of doing it and their way of doing it. Mm -hmm. I suppose, I'm not very good at this, but I this is my hypothesis, mm -hmm. despite all kinds of black boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is where we'd, we we would be with this this technology so there would be something i uh, we can call life on this level which would be human well capacity of experience uh and something called techniques which would be this let's call it artificial intelligence a very complicated technological system and they are still uh, there still is a gap between the two of them mm still is something happening between the two of them. There still is a, a life <clears throat> trying to become more than it is mm -hmm. by relating to this artificial intelligence and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So uh, so where, it, uh, now I, I should come back to the, uh, come at last to your question, where is agents in this? Mm -hmm. I think it still is, um, yeah. Well, if you take agents in the sense of somebody like Latour, you can put it everywhere. So there can be agency in in this life, which is having an experience, which is uh, inventing ways of relating to the world around it and so on and so forth. So that is an agency. But of course, there is a kind of agency also in this case, in the technical uh, thing, let's call it the artificial intelligence, but it could be any kind of technical thing. It has agency in the sense that it produces something, it brings something to the world. Maybe it's even creative in a sense, but its creativity is different than ours. Yeah, you can put agency everywhere, uh, but then you don't have a very strong form of agency. This is the, the kind of uh, agency that, that Latour is speaking about, which is very insp inspirational, I think. Uh, but it's not the kind of agency that we are thinking about when we, uh, we ask, uh, where is political agency? What, where is philosophical agency? Where is this responsibility? And even where is experience? I think mm. so. The question of agency becomes very difficult because, uh, yeah, if it's a capacity of starting something, uh, producing something, then it's everywhere, and there, our agencies are distributed. They are co-agencies, I suppose. Uh, but then you can have also more, more uh, how to say more difficult sense of agency, which is precisely knowing what you do and being responsible of what you do. And then it's uh, then it's not distributed in the same manner. Right. And we could call it philosophical agency, right? Uh, if we uh, echo with what you first said about self-reflexivity. So that mm -hmm. would be an agency that would be constantly on a feedback loop with its um, 
values, purposes. Um, yeah, perhaps so. So at least philosophy needs something like that. So if we are philosophers and try to have a philosophical agency, it requires all of this. But I think it's also if we are citizens, we need right. a vaster kind of... A right. If, if philosophy is only for philosophers, it's, it's uh, totally uh, boring and pointless. Uh, I think this is actually very interesting because... The way you describe self-reflection, mm. one could say that, in fact, most humans don't engage in it. And for various reasons, uh, lack of time, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and it's interesting that uh, there was this sort of a separation between philosophers of, and others. So I'm a little bit puzzled by... Uh, if if we say that the human specificity is is this self reflection, and of course there are different degrees of self reflection, right? Um, we could some people would say, oh, should I buy a house or a car? That's self reflection. I don't think so. Uh, but if we say self reflection is, and this is again to keep the theme of of AI, uh, which is simply. Uh, the current manifestation of the advance of, of technique. There is a, a book by Stuart Russell that was published in 2019 called Human Compatible, where, and Stuart Russell um, is one of the, uh, um, is usually called the Pope, one of the popes of AI, because he wrote a lot of the handbooks that students were uh, learning uh, in the last 20 years. But suddenly with his book, Human Compatible, uh, and, and that was before um, the explosion that we saw in the last two years with uh, um, conversational models, etc. But he, he did write, well, in fact, we got it all wrong because we were focused on the, the software instead of being focused on the designer, the human. And we humans, I'm, I'm quoting or, or, or I'm paraphrasing, uh, we humans are very bad actually defining our purposes. Uh, we usually formulate things that are actually self-destructive or counterproductive when we have a purpose. So basically what he's saying is that we should go back to philosophy, pause AI development and, and really figure out how do we how do we formulate our purposes that are actually, and so he basically, he doesn't mention Kant, but that's, he's going back to the categorical imperative, right? And the problem of when we have a purpose that is personal, what happens if everyone would do the same, basically, when it's uh, universalized. So, I still have a problem here, and I'm, I'm we, I mean, we have a problem because it's not uh, it's not like it's very comfortable to interview because of course uh um you sort of presuppose that you would have all the answers and it's more like a conversation where you're figuring out what's going on right uh but i think it i i'm very i'm going to come back to this idea of aristotle that uh, you do mention in the book and you mentioned now about um helping nature do something that it cannot do by itself right so let's say you use the the example of memory uh if i put on my phone a reminder uh it probably helps me uh not um uh, not forget something that i had to do today uh so so in this sense and correct me if i'm wrong this is the difference that you this is the sort of, uh, this is what technique does. But at the same time, we had a definition of technique, and it's also, I suppose, in your book, that is more about um, life combining itself in other ways. So that's ontologically part of life. And so I have a little bit of a problem understanding. Uh, it seems to be like there are two kinds of technique here, one that is biological and one that is comes from outside uh, physics and that um, 
like functions like a, a prosthesis, right? The, to use a term that uh, Stiegler uses. So maybe perhaps through explaining or or maybe Derrida, but to perhaps explaining what a pros prosthesis is mm -hmm. and how it's different from life, maybe we can understand this better. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, in a very fundamental manner, there is no outside from which a techniques could fall upon life. So right. technique is a continuation of life by other means, mm. uh, always. Mm. But it's also what what this continuation is. So uh, if life grabs a piece of uh, external matter in order to live better, in order to enhance its possibilities of survival, for instance, mm. uh, then this external matter becomes techniques and it can uh, present itself in many ways. So it can be... Uh, useful, it can be also toxic, it can be a prosthesis, it is a prosthesis in Derrida's and Stiegler's sense, in the sense that it is uh, something which is not growing from this life itself, it's a piece of matter that it grabs and uses somehow, so in this sense it's dead, it's external matter, it is a prosthesis, it's not a part of life itself, but just a supplement, and then this uh, this prosthesis can, of course, enhance life, help it become something better, something more than it was, but it can also be toxic to this life. It can poison it, it can uh, uh, hurt it, it can make it weaker, it can make it more stupid as well. Mm. So it's uh, it's um, a term that Stiegler developed very well. He found it in De uh, Derrida, but then he made something out of it. It's the pharmacon, right? It's the pharmacon. So like pharmacon, it's uh, remedy and poison at the same time. It helps and it can destroy. So you can't just take one of the sides. You always have them both. And I think te techniques is always that way. Right. I'm going to read two extracts, uh, which are called uh, citations, one from Descartes, one of Foucault. Um, I might have, I said it to you privately. I might not have said now in public, ow. Oh, how how good the book is because it's both it it it's both pedagogic. So I think uh, uh, a student who would like to enter into the philosophy of technology would get a lot from it. But at the same time, it's not dumbing down. It it keeps the level of of depth of the um, the philosophers uh, you quote. There is a fantastic uh, speaking of AI quote of Descartes. So we have to imagine Descartes is writing in the early 17th century. Uh, and you uh, you write, you write cite him in the fifth part of the discourse of the method. And the Descartes says, um, although machines can perform certain things as well as, or perhaps better than any of us can do, they infallibly fall short in others, by which means we may discover that they did not act from knowledge, but only from the disposition of their organs. For while reason is a universal instrument which can serve for all contingencies, these organs have need of some special adaptation for every particular action. From this it follows that it is morally impossible that there should be sufficient diversity in any machine to allow it to act in all the events of life in the same way as our reason causes us to act. So I think this is wonderful because uh, uh, it is five centuries or four centuries ago and we could basically construct an entire course uh, on the philosophy of AI based on what Descartes is saying here and, and there will be so much to... Um, to to unfold, but I think we can unfold it perhaps connecting it with another quote. And this time is Foucault, which you um uh also um deal with in the book uh very um very clearly and and, and usefully. Uh and it's the famous ending of the um the book The Order of Things, where he speaks about the end of uh uh, the end of uh, humanity. So, um, so I'm 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 reading from uh, Foucault as the as the archaeology of our thought easily shows, man is an invention of recent date, and one perhaps nearing its end. 
is if those arrangements were to disappear as they appeared, if some event of which we can at the moment do no more than sense the possibility without knowing either what its form will be or what it promises, were to cause them to crumble as the ground of classical thought did at the end of the 18th century, then one can certainly wager that man uh, would be erased like a face drawn in the sand at the edge of the sea. And, and here, when I was reading this, I, as, uh, I added sea of data. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that's the sea. Um, as an anecdote here, Foucault wrote uh, the draft of these lines when he was in Sweden. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, Uppsala, where he was uh, taking some uh, notes for, for what he thought would be a PhD, but Uppsala University told him, no, no, you're not good for a PhD. Uh, but that's another story. But he, he was inspired, he said in an interview that he was inspired by the social engineering in Sweden for his realization of the end of uh, humanity as we know it. And it's true that already in the 60s, Sweden was a, a very, um, you know, a, a biopolitical state and it still is in, in a way, although the machine is is um, dysfunctioning for, for for more and more for better or worse, right? But the fluxes of of uh, uh, the advancement of human politics are are very much computerized, um, and this is actually something that is expanding. So, what this I think this uh, book shows very very simply is that uh, the importance of philosophy in in trying to understand the world we live in. And, and I have two more um, points to mention. One is from the book and the other will be beyond the book on where you are now. But you do write that in the book that philosophy has difficulties in thinking the role of technicity in philosophical subjectivity itself. So what does that mean? So what, how, so we are philosophizing here. Uh, so of course we are using Zoom, but I think that's something else that you mean um, by the role of technicity. Could you expand on this? Yeah, because um, when the philosopher tries to understand what uh, him or herself is doing so we con we concentrate on consciousness on uh, on the way in which we know what thinking is and how our thinking proceeds and so on and so forth so so this is this is the tradition of what we do uh, but this clear and rational thinking that we do is actually based on so many techniques so many uh, you would say habitudes in one of your uh, your texts I think habitudes or or techniques of doing, techniques of thinking. So we base all of this in the techniques of language, in the techniques of thinking, in the techniques of uh, even using a computer, of course. So all of this is somehow, uh, well, it is the matter on which our spe <laughs> uh, thinking spirit uh, is laying, in a sense. And we don't pay much attention to that. So it is a secondary, it is... Uh, it is a little bit ridiculous, perhaps, or it is supposed to just serve us. This this is simply what I mean. Something that, that uh, already Derrida said a long time ago when he said that philosophers don't pay attention to, to writing. Well, writing is one of the techniques that we, uh, well, base our work on. But we think, we like to think that it is just the uh, transparent, uh, disappearing support of our wonderful thinking. So in the in the same sense, this is what I mean by techniques. Right. Uh, right, and and it's true that uh, I think in general we could say humans forget the level of uh, technicity and autopilot that informs their actions. Right, yeah. uh, I wouldn't say uh, that we are one hundred percent mechanical, but. Uh, Sociology, for example, has shown with uh, uh, Bourdieu and uh, Durkheim before that, 
how many of our uh what we think are our idiosyncrasies right uh, our musical preferences etc uh how uh determine the where they are which is what big data is using now also uh but what i think we could perhaps conclude on this book before we i'm curious where you at giving you a chance of explaining what you're doing now because this book was written uh some a uh, few years ago not so many but um so there is an idea in this book which is a very french idea i think that most french philosophers in their disagreement sometimes childish right you do for example show how derrida and foucault were like little boys fighting but they all i think they all point to what we could call what i would call singularity so the fact that determinism doesn't exhaust uh the fact of of life or the fact of being or becoming uh there is singularity in the world there is uh emergence of uniqueness there is creation of novelty and and at the same time we're not talking about the sing the technological singularity uh that some um transhumanists are predicting uh which defines a moment where um uh computer intelligence would would reach a point that basically beyond our understanding and and uh, uh which could be perhaps uh if we take a cosmic perspective a new form of singularity um but i think uh so this uh hope that i mean or optimism i think that i see uh in your book uh opens a door to define i think that there is in the end uh, almost a ecological uh tone where you you look at the f fertility uh of life so i'm wondering from this last page how did your thinking evolve and where are you at now today? What are you working on? Uh, well, precisely on ecology, that is, that is the question. So this book was, uh, uh, in a sense, looking backwards, looking into the question or, or into the anthropological question, the, the, the consciousness question as well, to some extent. And now I would like to work on the world in which this human being lives and other things live as well. Human being actually is not my favorite subject, has never been. It's not right. very interesting to me. What is much more interesting is, is, uh, is life itself. And today I don't think we can think about life without taking it in the context of technicity in many ways. So now I understand it much better, having gone through the human beings. Mm. So what is what is planetary? What is life as a planetary phenomenon? Uh, what happens to to life world perhaps when it becomes really out of the reach of a simple human existence and when it becomes really planetary, natural, technological, and yeah, well, that's the big ecological question today, of course. So this is what I work today, work on now. Yeah, there's a book project. Uh, if I I hope this summer I start to put it on paper. Mm -hmm. uh, much of it's, it is already ready uh, in my mind, but well, then there's all the, the work of uh, writing down. Mm -hmm. I hope I have the time, yeah. No, but that's wonderful. And we'll discuss these questions uh, together because uh, I do I do agree that um, in a way, and you do mention that French philosophers in the 20th century have been quite uh let's say disrespectful to the topic of um ecology yeah um and uh and i would agree and at the same time i think they have they have addressed it but in ways that are less familiar to us so for example this can be perhaps um a a way where we 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 leave things in 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 suspension uh, but when Deleuze uh, talks about uh, Leibniz and the folds of nature and and also 
uh, compossibility the idea that to make a world you need a balance between uh, sets of uh, possibles this is something that I'm very interested in now and I do think there is um, much in Leibniz that we could use today yeah. for our ecological thinking it's been uh, great is there anything that you would like I mean are we? I haven't uh, mention all the aspects, um, interesting aspects of your book. We've just uh, given an indication to the potential readers, I hope many, that uh, how important it is to delve into it, to understand the, the uh, realities in which we live in today. But um, I, I will let you have the last uh, word, whatever you want to say. I, I I don't know what to say. So so it it was was a pleasure uh, to discuss with you, and I think we have a lot of things to continue on. Uh, for instance, the, the idea of compostability, which is a very good one, uh, indeed. Excellent. Yeah, let's let's continue this conversation then. We will do that. Yes.